Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Crashes and Taxes. I am your host for this podcast, Rebecca Walser. I'm so excited to be back with you guys. As you can probably hear, my voice is uh, is recovered, actually, but um, I had lost my voice and everything. So, And I know I haven't been with you guys in a while, and I don't blame you if you never want to watch my podcast again, um, but I have been traveling. I was in London um, for over a week and I was in Mexico before that. And I run a practice, a very busy, busy practice. And right now my practice is extremely busy because of all the things we're going to talk about today that are going on in this world. So, you know, a lot of these podcasters, this is all they do. And, um, you know, they, they sign up and they get subscribers and I do this for free. I don't get any compensation. It's just because it's a passion of mine. I love to let you guys know what's going on and everything that's happening in this world. So it is a passion and it's a hobby, but that means that it has to be done when I'm not sick and I'm not traveling and I'm not busy with my practice. But I promise you, um, my marketing manager, she's like, the podcast is so great, Rebecca, as far as, you know, everyone that wants to hear and get the information it's got a really busy audience. So do me a favor. Let's keep growing it so that we can figure out how to make it monetizable. Not that it would have cost you guys anything, but we want to figure out a way to make it more part of the business so that we can actually stick to it and make it on my schedule and not something I'm just doing for fun. Because I know you guys really do need this information, especially what's coming and what's going on. We have so much information to go over today because um, I haven't been with you guys for a while. And I'm to the best I can to get this done. There is a four minute video that I want to play at the end because it's going to talk and speak to exactly what we're going through today. Um, and it's really worth your time and it's information that we're not finding in the Western media. It's, it's really being suppressed. It's not out there. Um, and, and there's obviously reasons that you'll can understand why it's not out there. So let's, let's start with what have we been missing? So I've got a lot to sort of, uh, you know, literally go through with you guys. So let's get started with the slides first and then we'll end with the video. So first thing I want to talk to you about is this came out at the end of September, third week of September, and this is talking about RBA, the Royal Bank of Australia. Now, the Royal Bank of Australia is insolvent. This is the Central Bank of Australia. They wrote down an accounting loss of 36.7 Australian dollars on their reserve funds um, because they did a mark to market equity position loss of 12.4 billion. And what that means is they are now actually insolvent. I'm going to read some of these words to you here. Bullock, which is the person that they're quoting this article on CNBC. Uh, Bullock noted that the lops is the lops. You guys, I'm still getting over this. This this is cold. It's not Corona. The losses eclipsed underlying earnings of 8.2 Australian dollars, left the central bank with an accounting loss of 36.7 billion Australian dollars. It ate up all of RBA's reserve funds, leaving it in a negative net equity position of 12.4 billion dollars. <laughs> Bullock noted that this would normally bankrupt a commercial entity. But because the RBA's liabilities are guaranteed by the government, this is not the case. Since it has the ability, RBA has the ability to create money. We are talking about the Central Bank of Australia, the Royal Bank of Australia. Since the bank has the ability to create money, the bank, and this is highlighted for you here, the bank can continue to meet its obligations as they become due. So it is not insolvent, said Bullock. The negative equity position will therefore not affect the ability of the Royal Bank to do its job. So let me just make sure that you're understanding this. They are publicly declaring that the central bank is bankrupt, illiquid. But they are saying this has no impact because the bank itself is the one that prints the money. And since it prints the money, it can continue to meet its obligations and therefore it is not bankrupt. I think if the Federal Reserve started printing bills and sent out a news flash to the world that we America was bankrupt, then nobody would be buying our federal treasuries. Kind of makes sense. 
this is what we're dealing with. I want you to understand what's going on with the Western banks, because we're going to do a dive here between the West and what's coming. So this is just the end of September. Then we have got the Bank of England. The Bank of England is, um, it's still ongoing as we speak this, this day that I'm recording this. You'll get this out. We'll get this out hopefully by Wednesday. Today's Monday, the 17th of October. My producer has to, you know, obviously do his production and it takes a little bit of time. So Bank of England, basically, this is an article also from CNBC, October the 6th. And what you have in England is you have the um, pension funds collapsing based on their LDI investments. So an LDI is an hedge transaction to mitigate risk. But the best way to describe it in a broad sense is think of yourself as investing on a margin where let's say that you want to invest a million dollars. I'm just giving you big numbers so you can think through this. Let's say you want to invest a million dollars, but you want to do it on margin. So maybe you gave them 500,000, but you keep 500,000 back. You say, go ahead and invest the full million. As long as the market is up and the stocks that that 500,000 that was on margin invested in, these are fake numbers, you guys, I'm not making, I'm making it real numbers. That 500,000, was as long as that the 500,000 has stocks worth 625, no one's making a margin call to you because you're in the, in the positive, you're in the money. But the second the market starts coming down and you start to be out of the money and now you're losing money, the bank isn't going to hold that liability. They're going to make a margin call. They're going to call you and say, you need to send us more money because now you owe us money. Your money has lost money. And so what's happening with these pension funds is they have these hedged calls and the values of them are dropping and they're getting basically liquidity calls. They're getting calls to add money to their investment because of the values in the market. And they don't have the money. So the Bank of England had to step up and buy bonds from the pension funds or what they call gilts in the UK. They had to buy them, which the, the Bank of England is not like the Federal Reserve. This is not like for us in America, that doesn't sound like any big deal. Like, OK, so they intervened and they got these things and big deal. Uh, to us, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually is quite a big deal. Um, they they actually do um, care that they are involved in the market. And so the Bank of England set a date that they would only intervene, but for so long. And they actually set that date to be October the 14th, Friday. They only gave them less than 20 days that they were intervening. And the thing is, is that on Friday, we saw the new UK Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who's only been there for about seventh week. I think it's her seventh week. She basically sacked, which is what they call in the UK. She sacked or fired her Treasury Secretary equivalent in the US and hired somebody who's been or replaced that person with somebody who's been in the cabinet for 30 years. So they went with a traditional candidate. So the issue is that the pension funds are not resolved and they're going to have the liquidity crisis rear its ugly head again. As the market comes down, there will be more and more calls to add funds. And these pension funds don't have that liquidity. And that's, in fact, the problem. So let's move on. And now we're going to look at, we're going to come back to Bank of England in a, in a minute. But Bank of England is out of helping at this point. They've got some changes in staff they're hoping that will help. But if we go back to see Bank of England re-engage or re-involve and pensions potentially collapsing in the UK, the pound and the Bank of England could be in big trouble. In the United States, on the state side, we just got a largest increase since the, in 40 years of the cost of living adjustment for Social Security. 8.7%. That is on the back of a 2021 increase of 5.9%. So you're talking about almost a 6% in 2021, almost a 9%, almost a 15% increase, although it's more than that because it's 9% on top of the 6%. So you've got a 15% plus increase in the amount the federal government has to pay in Social Security benefits. And while this is good for the beneficiaries, it's terrible for the system because, as you know, um, Social Security in America is, in fact, bankrupt. There is no $3 trillion in the $3 trillion trust fund. There's only STN, special treasury notes. Look it up. 
special treasury notes, STNs, are all we have in our trust fund. And so we don't have, if we're, you know, payroll taxes, FICA taxes, so Med, FICA, and FICA, which are your payroll for Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes, those are 15.3% of every employee's paycheck. The employer pays 7.65, the employee pays 7.65. So that's 15.3% already of that person's income that's being paid to the government for that on behalf of that employee, half by the employee, half by the employer. But where, if we're only charging 15.3% of someone's salary for their benefits, where is the federal government going to come up with another 8.7% in costs to go out without our income offset? We don't have it. And so taxes must go up or we must cut benefits, but we're raising them. So this is a, this is a problem as far as how fast we're going to get to some issues. All right. So back to Bank of England. I just want to show you how wide this problem is. You can see International Business Times picking up this article. And this brings me back to the United States. So I want you to understand the size and scope of the issue in the United States. We are going, we are entering a liquidity crisis phase of this problem. We've gotten now down so far that all of these calls going out for additional liquidity to be added to investments, whether they're on margin, whether they're, um, LDIs, whatever the case might be, we have in the United States of America over two quadrillion, two quadrillion of dollars in derivatives. So you're probably like, what's two quadrillion? So let's go back. The first thing that we know is the IMF has done a study and they're estimating the best estimate I've been able to find in my research. And if any of you can find something and you want to send, you know, a quote or a, a research, the best exam, the best analysis I can find for the whole value of all of the assets of all the world is about five hundred trillion dollars. That's every intellectual property, every hardware, every software, every natural resource, natural mineral, water, every possible rare earth mineral, every human, every idea, every everything, all in is about worth about five hundred trillion. Now derivatives are investments that derive their value, that's the name derivative, they derive their value from an underlying asset class. They're derived off of an underlying asset basket. So derivatives are finding their value based off of a total world asset value of approximately 500 trillion. So if we just look at this chart right here, I know it's smaller for you guys, but if we just look at this chart we see here, JP Morgan, has $61 trillion in derivative investment assets alone, the investment bank, JP Morgan. Now, I did a podcast where we talked about the recapitalization of the investment banks in 2019 to the tune of $11 trillion. Why is it that our investment banks had to be recapitalized at the end of 2019 for $11 trillion that just got reported at the beginning of 2022 based on Fed re reporting requirements, yet... We didn't even have Corona until 2020. What happened in 2019? And this will get to the answer that I'm trying to lead you guys to is that the system was already at its end. When you have a debt fiat system, a system that is not based on any intrinsic hard assets underlying, you're going to get to a point where the stimulus has to continue in order to keep the system going. A system that is based on stimulus has to constantly have stimulus or it will collapse. This is what we're seeing in the UK and it will not be avoided in America. It will come to America and this is what we're seeing again. A lot of people think we're in a lot better position with derivatives since the 2008 global financial crisis or what we call in America, the great recession. But, um, it is not to be. It is not to be. We did not learn our lesson from 2008, unfortunately. So this is um, a governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, and he told the world this past week on Thursday that they literally only had three days, which was until the 14th, for them to for the pension funds to rebalance and basically get their 
could have the needs met because the Bank of England was not going to continue to be involved. And um, as you can see, we're now at the beginning of the next week. And so we're waiting to see, do we have any more fallout? This is a great um, little conversation to visit from just their annual meeting that they had, where you can just see a Bank of England governor explaining it's not normal. They don't get involved in buying these kinds of gilts on a normal basis, like the Federal Reserve does here with our treasuries, and that they want to get in and out. And they just did this as an emergency to stabilize. So the UK is something that we're watching strongly. Any problem with the UK pound um, will be a contagion impact over to the United States. So that brings me to what is the bigger movement of all of this? Why is this happening? What's going on? And this is when we start to talk about the basal one and two and now three requirements. The basal requirements basically started in 2009 with the Bank of International Settlement and all of its 63 member banks. And that's 63 member central banks ac across the globe, although 23 of them are really the ones that kind of run the whole world but that would be it would be down to. So what they did with Basel one and two was just set up regulations on how the Bank of International Settlements, Settlements, BIS, is going to work with all of the central banks, all these things, nothing big. But Basel three did something where it changed uh, gold. Gold had been a tier three asset class. Tier three asset classes are considered a uh, somewhat risky asset class, and it only counts at 50% of its value on your balance sheet. Well, in the last several years, we've had multiple countries, and the most recent time frame, I would say Turkey is the most. We've had many countries that are buying much reserves in gold. And so the Bank of International Settlements and all of its central bank members voted to move gold from a tier three asset class at 50% of its fair market value to a tier one asset class to be the equivalent of cash. This is very important for any country that is strategically moving to back its currency again with hard assets, i.e. gold, that it be valued, its gold reserves be valued as valuable as the currency that is based upon it. There is, uh, there could be one country now, but we don't have gold backed currency right now at this time. Why would the central bank of all central banks, BIS, and the central bankers vote to make gold again a tier one asset class? What are they preparing for? And we know they are preparing for the world to move back to a central bank currency that is once again backed by hard assets. Now, this is not something the West is wanting to do. This is not something that the West wants to do. They don't want this at all. In fact, the West believes, and I think the central bankers believe that they are moving towards the Great Reset, which we've discussed on this podcast many times. The Great Reset being a reset to all digital currency. There's a really great chart. It tells you all the stages of where each country is in, in currency, digital currency exploration, but it's completely inaccurate. It says that America's made major inroads, but that's not true at all. We are in full, and let me repeat this, we are in full beta testing of the FedNow platform as we speak. And it is to be fully operational by May of 2023, we must do all we can to stand against a central bank digital currency because a central bank digital currency is not a currency at all. It is programmable vouchers, if you will, that basically can tell you this is your food money. You can only spend it at these grocery stores or at these restaurants, but you can't spend it here. Oh, this is your rent money. You must pay your rent before the end of the month or else it will disappear. There, it is a voucher controllable binary system controlled by the central planner bank of where you can and cannot spend your money. And can you accumulate money anymore? No, because they will put time limits on everything. Central bank digital currency is basically digitized communism. It is what uh, ties into social credit scores and all of these things that we've been discussing. We talked about, or I might have mentioned, 
how um, the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, has already negotiated with all of his BlackRock companies, which is the Fortune 500, by the way. I mean, I can't think of any company in the Fortune 500 that does not have BlackRock as one of its top seven shareholders. So basically, BlackRock, along with all of its S&P 500 companies, have agreed to start including, this is what they're doing in Europe, only it's forced under the accounting regulations in Europe. It's a forced requirement. But in America, we're doing it fascistically. And fascism, for all of you that are wondering, what is the definition of fascism? Fascism is really uh, the most basic explanation I can give you is where a government is prescribed or prevented from doing things to their citizenry because a citizenry has rights and the government would be encroaching on those rights. Those things that government cannot do can be left to private corporations for them to do. Because technically a private corporation, you have a right to do business with that company or not. And if you don't like their rules for doing business, you don't do business with them. So in theory, the corporations, and this is obviously seen by the World Economic Forum and what they call the public-private partnership. That's how they call it. It's the public-private partnership. And really, this is communist China's exact model. The government owns a majority of most corporations, although there's definitely multiple business uh, entity classifications in China. I'm not going into that right now. But the general model is the government is the primary um 51% majority owner of the company and private businesses own a minority. And that's how the capital gets invested. So it is a public private partnership, but it is still communism. It might be commun communistic capitalism, but it is still communistic at the end of the day. So in America, how they will do these things in America is they will say to all the corporations, it's very similar to what happened with PayPal in the last 10 days. PayPal came out and announced that if you were uh, guilty of communicating um, misinformation, they would fine you $2,500. It got released to the public. The public memed it out in you know, Twitter and Instagram and all these uh, pictures. And they retracted it and said, oh, no, 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 we, we aren't doing that. But it's only because people saw what they did and, and, and raised a, a flag. We will get to a point in this country if this doesn't get nipped in the bud. If we were going to central bank digital currency, we would 100% get to the point in this country where every single corporation would unilaterally all create the same rules at the same time. So it doesn't matter. You can't leave PayPal to go to Venmo because Venmo won't charge you for misinformation for $2,500 because then we'll have the exact same policy and there will no be no longer be any free choice. Yeah, you can use A or B, but if A and B's policy and procedures are the exact same, there's no free choice or there's no choice in the system to get you around that requirement that you don't like. And this is what's been happening to the American people. We've been losing more and more and more of our opportunities and options. And this is why in the pandemic, you could see this. They were killing small business America and middle American job companies because they, you know, was, it, the churches couldn't stay open. The mom and pops couldn't stay open. But, you know, if you were critical, if you were a critical, like a Home Depot or a grocery store, you got to stay open. So you can see the, the favoritism for big corporations over small mom and pops, um, even just with the pandemic rules. Could they kill off small and medium-sized businesses in America and just have the Fortune 500s left that they can then negotiate these massive public-private partnership agreements with? And you can see how the government and with private partnership cooperation all of a sudden has certain controls over Americans that they've never been able to have before. There's a case uh, in Massachusetts, Dr. Shiva, that's going through that will be a very important case um, because it shows exactly how um, Facebook and Twitter both have back channels to local governments that do, in fact, on a routine basis and through a mechanized process, send information to the social networks for censorship against what the local government wants. This is state action. It's completely not right. It is completely against the First Amendment. And that case is ongoing. And it is a very important case. We're going to have seen so many cases that will come out over the next 60 months where all of these things will be uncovered and will be restoring our rights. But I want to just go back and digress and just return to the fact that the Bank of International Settlements 
through their regulations of their member banks, of the central banks of the world, the 63 central banks of the world, most of which 23 run the world, um, they have now made gold a tier one asset again. This is a huge indication that um, we are looking at asset-backed currencies and going away from a central bank digital currency, which is what we want. We know that we are still in the middle of an oil situation. Um, so Biden's administration obviously let us know that he was going to Saudi Arabia to ask them to actually increase. We said, well, everyone, the media said the Biden's going over there to ask them to increase more and produce more production. Of course, we know that not only do they not agree to, to produce more, but instead of cutting only a million barrels a day, they're actually cutting two million barrels barrels a day. And I guess Mr. Biden asked if that could be done after the election. And Saudi Arabia not only decided not to wait, but Saudi Arabia publicly announced what Mr. Biden did. Now, this is disrespectful of our administration. And it shows a level of disrespect from Saudi Arabia that we haven't seen blatantly. Um, I have to think of what other uh, yeah, I don't can't think of another president where Saudi Arabia has come out and so publicly been so dismissive of our administration. That is a sea change or a tone change in Saudi Arabia. And so drill down. Why is this happening? Why? What's going on? And we drill down and we find out. Oh, OK. Well, in 2021 when America's exit of Afghanistan was disastrous, Saudi Arabia, which in February of 1974, the king and Rick, Rick, the king and Henry Kissinger worked out an agreement to have America be Saudi Arabia's backup military or military protection in return for ensuring that all of the OPEC producing nations, the 13 OPEC producing nations would all sell oil in US dollars thus birthing the petrodollar, thus giving us a semi-quasi-asset backing to our fiat currency since the 70s. So we see now a new attitude between Russia and Saudi Arabia because they have now a cooperative joint military agreement signed in 2021. We see this dismissive nature of Saudi Arabia to the Biden administration, specifically on terms of oil. And so what we're starting to realize is that Saudi Arabia is moving in the direction towards the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. We now know that there is a slew of other nations, Egypt, Turkey, that are all, in fact, we have for the first time ever an alliance that has just formed between Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And these three countries are going to allow to trade between the trilaterally between the three of them, and they're going to be able to use a land bridge. This has never happened before. We're starting to see, uh, that's a Revelations 38 Gog Magog situation shaping up there um, for the future. So we're starting to see Saudi Arabia move away towards the United States and rapidly towards the BRICS nations. And this is so imperative because right now, even though the petrodollar is dead, it is dead because Russia was kicked out of SWIFT and Russia decided to no longer sell Russian energy in the dollar, which it had previously done. The OPEC producing nations, including Saudi Arabia, they're still selling in US dollars. But if Saudi Arabia makes a switch and no longer requires their OPEC producing nations to trade in dollars, to sell in dollars, then that's the collapse of the dollar imminently. So this is a huge contagion out of Saudi Arabia. And the fact that they are being so dismissive to our administration is not a good sign at all. So I want to circle back around and just talk about the market and how it's done and where we expect the market to go. So I basically told our clients literally at the 
in, in November. Last year, we started running the analysis and the performance and looking at what kind of year 2022 was going to be. And we knew it was going to be a macroeconomic year and that it was not going to be a year based off of quarterly returns and it wasn't going to just be earnings season and let's talk about where the market's headed. It was going to be much, much more macroeconomic than that. And so we basically said, listen, if you're the kind of investor that wants to get out at the top and not lose anything, you know, buy low, sell high kind of person, um, now's your time. And I was actually, we were right on two of the indexes. We missed uh, one index by one month. but. Ever since along the way, there have been about four different places where I could see that there was going to be a market down swing. And we don't want that for our clients. We want our clients to not um, lose money ever. But yet at the same time, you know, the whole point of going up, you guys, is to capture and realize it. If it was just a paper gain and now, you know, it's you're coming back down and you're, you know, you're in and not a lot of people don't want to lock in losses because they didn't you know, didn't get out. They, they have losses now and they don't want to lock them in. But here's the problem because I know that we are moving to a new system. You know, there's two opportunities. There's two possibilities. Of course, the central bankers believe that we're going for the great reset, which is central bank digital currency globally everywhere. And Russia and the BRICS nations think we're moving to multipolarity and, you know, hard asset backed again. We have to do the second one. We don't have a choice. We must do the second one. And the reason that we cannot allow for central bank digital currencies to come online is because that much power concentrated, the power of money concentrated with a central group. And in the United States, this is not a part of the government. This is a private corporation chartered by Congress in 1913 to centralize the power of a digital currency to a non federal government entity, <coughs> but to a private corporation is unacceptable. I will not have my money controlled by some private corporation. No, no, thank you. There must be an alternative legal U.S. tender. And as Americans, we must all say this because if we don't, and our only source of money is a central bank digital currency that they can control, good luck with your freedom. So I'm going to end the podcast with this video coming out of India. It is a well-known Indian news source, but I'm going to leave the last four minutes. I want you to hear about the de-dollarization efforts that the BRICS nations have undertook. They are happening. It is happening and it's happening as we speak. And I think this is an excellent summary by an Indian um, TV show that really explains what Russia and China are doing. And then what's lastly and most, you know, not most importantly, but lastly, what also India is doing. And I would just end with you guys to say that um, everything I've said up until this point is on course, on track. We are starting to see massive cracks. Um, look at the Royal Bank of Australia is illiquid. The Bank of England has gotten is has major problems. We see the de-dollarization, which you're about to see in earnest here in a minute. And then we've got to push back against central bank digital currency because it is just a 100% control method. I mean, think about it. If someone controls your money, remember, remember, currency right now is anonymous. Like, no, you can't send a wire anonymously. No, you can't go buy a house anonymously, but you can buy food anonymously. You can go and buy groceries anonymously. You can go and pay, you know, pay for whatever you want to go do anonymously. When you have a central bank digital currency and everything's digital, that's all wiped out. There's no more anonymity. There's no more anonymity. It's gone. Everything is done and tied to a source and a use. Everything. So I just want you to understand how much control a central banker would have over a digital currency. And let's go ahead now and add the video. Russia and China are looking to break the dollar's dominance. They want to de-dollarize their economies. How exactly does that work? The first step is usually trade. Right now, all imports and exports are priced in dollars. Oil, gas, cars, clothes, each and every product. 
product is pegged to the US dollar. Russia and China are hoping to change that. They want to trade in their own currencies, the yuan and the ruble. Yesterday, Gazprom and its Chinese partners decided to move to rubles and yuan in 50-50 split when paying for Russian gas supply. I would add that short-sighted actions have spurred global inflation. It has already surpassed records that have been set many years ago in various countries. As expected, Russia, as expected, gas is the first target. In 2019, China had signed a 30-year gas deal with Russia. Shipments will reach 15 billion cubic meters by the end of this year. Until now, this trade was conducted in dollars, but not anymore. Gazprom will now receive payments in local currencies, 50% in yuan, 50% in rubles. And this is what we call de-dollarization. But the question is, how does it benefit Russia and China? You see, the dollar's domination indirectly means America's domination. It gives the U.S. a lot of influence over other economies through sanctions, through interest hikes, through monetary tightening. De-dollarization can prevent that. It can reduce America's influence over the global economy. Russia has been doing that since 2014. Their dollar-denominated assets amount to just 16%. In 2013, 95% of their trade with BRICS countries was done via dollars, and now less than 10%. So Russia has consciously made the effort to shun the US dollar, and China is doing the same. They have created a digital currency called EUR. They also have renminbi trading centers in Hong Kong, Singapore, Europe. You can see why it's a desirable prospect. The current oil boom is draining the forex reserves of, of most countries. Governments are dipping into their reserves to import oil. De-dollarization can prevent that. And it's not just Russia and China. Even India is doing this. Indian companies are using Asian currencies to buy Russian coal. In June, 44% of the trade was done via other currencies. For India, this is purely financial. It's about securing the best deals. But for China and Russia, it is political. It's about challenging the US-led world order. China and Russia are looking to further integrate their economies. In June, yuan ruble trade rose to a six-month high. Spot trading was worth around $48 billion. The question is, will it be enough to displace the dollar? Right now, the answer is no. The dollar's dominance dates back to the 1970s. That's when the U.S. struck an oil deal with Saudi Arabia. The kingdom agreed that oil would be priced in dollars. And that is key to the dollar's preeminence. It has full convertibility. It is backed by the American economy and military and is deeply integrated with the world economy. Let me give you some numbers here. 60% of all reserves held by central banks are in dollars. 70% of all trade is done in dollars. Changing that will be a long process. China and Russia alone cannot do this, which is why they are looking to create a block of like-minded countries, like the BRICS. China is eager to expand the BRICS to include more developing countries like Argentina, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Together, these countries have a lot of clout. They could challenge the dollar's dominance. But how should India see this campaign? Well, trading in local currencies benefits India as well. Recently, the Reserve Bank of India permitted trade payments in the Indian rupee. There are also talks of a rupee-ruble trade. All of this would reduce the pressure on India's forex reserves. It would also prop up the rupee. But what about the political fallout then? Challenging the dollar is like challenging America. It also means buying into China's campaign. Remember, <coughs> Beijing wants to use the financial system to dominate politically. So India's choices must be weighed carefully. And we're able to use that because um, it's the fair use doctrine. If you're using something for educational purposes, then you can do that and not violate any copyrights. So we are using that under the fair use exception to copyright material. So you guys, um, 
We are in the midst of a lot of the world de-dollarizing. Um, at the same time, we're going through massive increases in our rate hikes because we still have inflation coming in hot. We will get another rate hike of 75 basis points as we expect right now in November from the Fed. That's not going away. So the bond world will continue to collapse. The equity markets will continue to hate that. And if we get any kind of contagion from the UK or Australia, New Zealand, any of these uh, five eyes that we have such big relationships with would be a contagion on the United States dollar. We are in the thick of this thing, you guys. It is just beginning. This is the beginning of the end of the fiat system that I've been preparing you guys all for. It is now upon us. It is here. The circumstances have arrived and other countries are talking about the de-dollarization of the world. Remember, just the populations of China and India alone are almost half the world. So BRICS plus a lot of other countries that have a lot of economic uh, capital are, it's really big problematic for us. So until next time, you guys, I will try to do a podcast a week. That's the mission, especially now. Take care, everybody.